health privacy laws haven't really changed since 1996, but the collection of health data certainly has. I'm Tanya Hall, and joining me is Dr. Brooke Grinlinger, Chief Scientific Officer for the New York Academy of Sciences. Welcome, Dr. Grinlinger. Thank you so much for having me today. Absolutely. What is the mission of the New York Academy of Sciences? And summarize your role there. So for more than 200 years, the New York Academy of Sciences has been bringing together people that are at the forefront of science and technology. And we're trying to drive innovation by supporting scientific research, science education, and science policy. And we're really interested often at the intersection of where science meets society. So in my role at the New York Academy of Sciences, I oversee a large portfolio of scientific conferences, workshops, symposia, and related publications and resources that we produce that can bring the latest in science and tech innovations to professional scientists, as well as to introduce science discoveries to the general public so that everybody understands how science and technology plays a key role in their everyday lives. One of the hottest topics in the medical technology sector is the integration of machine learning, artificial intelligence, and big data analytics into the healthcare operations. In addition to the medical office setting, medical data now pours from smartphones, wearables, our social media posts, and at-home genetic tests. What are the privacy concerns, if you will, emerging uh, from this flood of data? So we really are at the very beginning of what's being touted as a data revolution. We are seeing all of these devices and different platforms that are suddenly capable of collecting very personal information about us, and particularly with regard to health data. And with any great technological leap comes some challenges and concerns. So some of the issues that have been raised right now about the integration of big data through these technologies, particularly in terms of how they could be integrated into healthcare, begins with data sharing, for example. Big data, in order to get to the big in big data, we need to pool a lot of data from a lot of consumers and a lot of patients. And that data comes from a lot of different sources and a lot of different organizations. And each source or entity that's collecting that data may collect data, store it and label it in very different ways. So first of all, we need to be really thoughtful about how we standardize how information is collected through all of these mobile and digital platforms so that it can be pooled in a way that is harmonious and makes it much easier for individuals to utilize. Another growing area of concern is around the potential for the introduction of bias to be introduced into how we gather and utilize data from some of these technologies. We all know that there's some inequalities in the way we collect data. For example, about 80% of genomic information is Caucasian data. So when we're using that genomic information to try and develop new tools, new diagnostics, or new therapies, there's a very good chance that those new tools and technologies that may ultimately roll out based on that data might not actually be successful in certain segments of our population. And a great example of that was a diabetes test that was based on genomic data and because it was based on a data set that was largely Caucasian data, was ultimately discovered after the test was rolled out that it wasn't very successful in the African-American portion of the population. So we really need to appreciate that we can't just be collecting data on relatively healthy, young, white, often male individuals in our population. We really need to be much more inclusive in terms of the data that we collect so that it accurately reflects the diversity of our population, and then ultimately the healthcare deliverables or new products that are rolled out based on that data are more relevant and more likely to be successful for our entire population. And beyond the potential to introduce bias, there's also some concern around can big data be used to discriminate against certain individuals? So all of this data that's being collected about us, whether it's in the doctor's office or on your smartphone or smartwatch, 
that's being uh, de-identified and it can be shared with all sorts of different organizations. And there's the opportunity for perhaps some of that information to label certain consumers in a way that might negatively impact them. For example, some consumers have had difficulty getting life insurance or are being charged higher premiums because of specific unique health data about themselves. So we wanna really be able to protect consumers so that they know how data about them is being used to make decisions that could positively or negatively impact them. And then the last one I'll mention is the concern around privacy and ownership. Today, big data is really big business. All of this data that's been collected can be de-identified and packaged together with data from many, many other consumers and patients. And then that data package can be sold to data brokers. And data brokers then will sell that information to all sorts of other organizations. They might be organizations doing very highly respected medical research in an effort to identify new therapies or diagnostics or they might sell it to organizations that are purely interested in data about us for commercial reasons. So we have to be very thoughtful about the privacy safeguards that are put in place. And the question's also coming up about who's profiting from all this data. And if my data has been collected by a company, should I have the opportunity to profit from that information? Should I license my own data? Maybe collect royalties from it? So there's really interesting questions coming up about who owns your data, who sees it, who can sell it, and who they can sell it to. That's a really interesting ethical dialogue right now. Tell us about the Protecting Personal Health Data Act that was recently introduced into the US Senate. So this is a bipartisan bill that was just introduced last Friday, June 14th, and it is really trying to close the gap around some of these uh, privacy and security issues that have come about because of the digital revolution in the way today we can collect data about many different types of people from many different platforms. Uh, many people are probably familiar with HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Protection Act. And that guards against, um, it puts rules in place about how uh, healthcare providers and medical insurers can share sensitive health data about you. HIPAA was brought into legislation in 1996. And it's pretty funny when you think about 1996, Google wasn't even incorporated yet. So, Today, we live in a very different digital world and laws like HIPAA haven't really caught up to the current digital and big data world that we live in. So this new act is trying to zero in on where those gaps are. And it's specifically looking at health tech apps that we often have on our smartphones or other devices. It's also looking at wearable devices like Fitbits, and another category that it's expressly zooming in on is direct to consumer at home genetic testing kits. All of the data, personal health data that these different platforms collect about us is being collected well outside the boundaries of privacy and security that's covered by HIPAA legislation. So I'm really encouraged to see this proactive effort to try and protect consumer privacy and safeguard data. But I'm also hoping that we can strike a balance such that we're not stifling innovation because we have an incredible opportunity to use these tools and technologies in big data to really drive forward some incredible advances that will help boost the health of our society and individuals around the world. Thanks again, Dr. Brooke Grindlinger, Chief Scientific Officer for the New York Academy of Sciences. If somebody wants to connect with you, Brooke, maybe they want to find out more about the work that you're doing at the New York Academy of Sciences, or maybe they want to connect with you personally. How can they do that? For those that want to learn more about the New York Academy of Sciences, I direct you to our website, www.nyas.org. And you can also connect with me individually on LinkedIn. Sounds good. And if you guys want to find more of my interviews, you can do that right here or go to my website, tanyahall.net. Thanks for watching.